So in 1980, uh, the world changed. Rubik came out with his cubes. And from one day to the next, basically, the world changed into one big, huge Rubik's cube. <laughs> <laughs> I was there, so it happened. Um, so I was actually going to high school, and I got hold of one of those Rubik's cubes. And uh, the next three, three weeks were a blur, basically. I was just there trying to solve this thing. Um, and after three weeks, I, I could do the Rubik's cube. I could do anything. Right? So you give me a Rubik's cube, anything scrambled, I could do it. Well, that's, that's pretty much the end of it for, for most people. I mean, there's a lot of people who can, can do the Rubik's Cube these days. Um, so um, is it now solved once and for all? Uh, well, definitely not for, for real mathematicians like myself. And actually, most people who, who do the Rubik's Cube, what they do is they kind of go out, Google, solve Rubik's Cube, and take somebody else's recipe, memorize it, and then that's what they unleash on, on a Rubik's Cube. But that's not what I call solving. And actually, that's not what I did at the time. Uh, so when I first got my Rubik's Cube, I didn't look up anything, you know, and I just tried for three weeks to come up with a method myself to actually solve Rubik's Cubes. Um, just in general, I mean, uh, that was pretty much my first really, really, really big maths problem that I solved. I mean, Rubik's Cube is inherently very mathematical. It's got, you know, permutations in the background, algebraic structures, a uh, lot of com complexity, of course. Um, so it's, it's, it's very mathematical, you know, three, three week problem, I solved it, you know, that in many ways that got me going as a mathematician. And I know a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues that had similar kind of experiences. Not only that, uh, I mean, just the Rubik's Cube in itself, you know, everybody was playing with it. Uh, so it just, from one day to the next, there was this, this big Mount Everest in front of us, in front of anybody who wanted to engage with thing in a serious way. We had to conquer it, right? We had to know everything about it. And, well, things, I mean, you would think that by now we would know everything about the Rubik's Cube, but that's, that's not it at all. In fact, one of the main questions has only been solved recently, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. Everybody knows that the Rubik's Cube is hard, okay? You know that the Rubik's Cube is hard? You've tried. Um, just how hard is it? Okay, just how hard is it? Well, I've got a whole collection of these things here, so let me just show you quickly how hard something like this is. So there's a Rubik's Cube here. And I'm just going to take it apart for you. I mean, at the time, what people actually recommended, if you can't do it, you take the stickers off and then put them on again. <laughs> but it's actually not a good idea at all, <laughs> because those stickers will never really stay where they're supposed to be. So what you, what you can do is you can just kind of twist this thing like a 45 degrees, and then you dig in with your finger like that, and then you can actually just take it apart like that. And those things actually come together quite easily, and I'm just going to explode this here. So it's going, it's almost gone. So there, yeah. Right. <laughs> and the only thing left over is, is this middle part. I'll just show you all the pieces now here. So we've got a cube, so we've got uh, eight corner pieces, and we've got 12 edges, so we've got 12 edge pieces. And then we've also got this 3D cross in the middle, and that thing is actually completely welded together. That doesn't move at all, okay? So that doesn't move at all. When you, when you operate the cube, this will kind of stay fixed in the middle. Okay, now just imagine all those pieces here lying around. Um, put on a blindfold, and let's just figure out how we can put this thing together. Well, I grope around on the table, grab the first piece, kind of put it back into the cross, grab the second piece, put it into the cross, and I just keep on going until I've got something cubical in my hand, okay? And that won't look like the cube on the right, guaranteed. <laughs> There's a very, very, very small chance of that happening. So how many, how many different ways can you actually put this thing together? It's actually quite easy to calculate. You know, like, you take a corner piece, there's eight corner positions, you put them somewhere, right? Then there's seven left, so the seven, second corner can go into seven different places. Okay, and the next one is six and so on. So eight times seven times six times five and so on. You can calculate that and you can orient them in a couple of different ways. Anyway, pretty straightforward calculation and you get, well, a few, <laughs> a few combinations here. So you can, you can put the cube into that many different configurations, okay? That's quintillions. So just give you an idea. If you measure the surface of the Earth in millimeters squared, that's about the number you get, right? So if you, you know, 
if you maybe shrink a cube to one millimeter times one millimeter times one millimeter, take that many of them, you can cover the surface of, of the Earth with, with those mini cubes. So it's a lot of cubes. It's a, it's a big, huge number. Now, this number there, really easy to kind of come up with, but actually only some of these configurations can actually be solved with legal moves. And the real number of configuration is a bit smaller. And there's a nice relationship between the two numbers. Um, there's a, you know, you just divide the first number by 12 and you get the number of configurations. So if you do this blindfolded experiment and you ask what's the probability to actually get something that can be solved, it's one in 12. So you get a one in 12 chance. Now, to actually figure out what the 12 does, that's some really, really nice mathematics. Uh, so the first number is very easy to get that 12 to justify that. That takes some smart thinking. All right, now, so we've got, we've got all these things to deal with. Like anybody who designs like an algorithm, like me all those years ago, when I designed my algorithm to take care of any Rubik's cube, my algorithm, my recipe has to be able to take care of all those possibilities, right? So that sounds like a really, really formidable task. Now, when the Rubik's Cube came up, um, you know, mathematicians, well, they were pretty much the first ones who really got hold of this thing. I still have some colleagues, some older colleagues who tell me, well, the thing came out. I just left my work. I went to Hungary. I got this thing. <laughs> and I got a couple of other ones and brought them back to, uh, to, to the UK, actually. And uh, it was a big, big hit in mathematicians. And they were also the first ones who kind of come up with some really good, good recipes for solving these things. So, what else did they do? Well, there's the Mount Everest. What's a really, really good maths question to ask? Well, the really, really good maths question to ask is beyond just finding a method that works for everything, is to find the best method to solve the Rubik's Cube. And so what do I mean by this? Well, um, just imagine you've got uh, like all those different configurations, like put the first configuration into one Rubik's Cube, the second configuration in another Rubik's Cube, and just line them all up. Yeah, just line them all up. And now we look at the first guy and say, well, what's the minimum number of moves it takes to do this one, to solve this one, okay? Then you do the same for the second one, the third one. So you've basically got these different configurations that you've got numbers hovering above them, right? And then you took, look at all those numbers and see what's the worst case scenario, right? So that one might take 15, that one might take 17. What's the worst? You know, what's the worst it can take to, to solve this? So if you've got you know, some really superhuman being, how, how many moves would it take? Um, hmm. Well, there are some superhuman beings in Melbourne. So the, the champion speed cuber, he does it in about like a Rubik's cube, a three by three by three in an average of seven seconds or something like this. <laughs> how, many, how many moves do you think they take on average? Uh, well, about 50, 60 in less than 10 seconds. You don't see, even see the moves, right? so it's, it's, it's spectacular. But uh, it actually gets a lot better if you go for optimal, okay? And so optimal is really asking for um, God's algorithm, you know? God's, what, what would God do <laughs> if he had to do the Rubik's Cube? Okay, well, how do you do something like this, right? I mean, you've got this huge, 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 huge number of possibilities. How do you conquer something like this? Well, um, just recently, we were facing a similar sort of problem. At that point in time, it was really a matter of life and death to solve this. And I, 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 I'm assuming that a lot of people will now guess what it was. It was kind of figuring out uh, how to crack the Enigma cipher machine, okay? So Enigma cipher machine that was used by the Germans. The Germans, that's my guys, you can probably tell from the accent. <laughs> so they were uh, enciphering all their messages with, with this machine. Now, on the slide, you can see like three arrows. So the three arrows, they point at three rotors. The rotors have the 26 letters of the alphabet on it, and they can be put in the machine in all possible ways. And basically, you know, uh, sometimes it's three rotors, sometimes it's five rotors, and with really big machines, you come up to about a million possibilities of um, you know, just putting the rotors in the machine. Uh, so that's a lot of possibilities, but actually it gets a lot worse because then we've also got the green arrow, and the green arrow points at a plug board, right? And that you see like uh, letters of the alphabet again there, and you can actually connect up uh, pairs of letters of the alphabet with cables, right? And that switches around things 
worse, right? <laughs> and so if you take all those possibilities together, like how do you put the rotors in, how do you put the plugs in, you get about the same number of positions as, as positions of a Rubik's cube. So it's bad, right? And what makes it worse is that the, LA, or the Germans actually set up this machine on every day in a different way, okay? So basically it works as, uh, like in the morning, everybody who has one of those machines sets it up in exactly the same way. Then throughout the day, messages get transmitted using that setting, so they kind of float around, and they're, pu they're publicly available, right? So they can be intercepted, uh, but they're of no use if you don't know how the Enigma machine is set up in the first place. So you intercept all these messages, and you look at them, and then you have to somehow infer from these messages how the machine's set up, and then you're okay. But you have to do this like once a day, right? Otherwise, pretty useless. Okay, so how do you do this? So how do you do this? Uh, well, it's a combination of kind of brute force computing and being really, really, really smart, okay? <laughs> and actually the people who did the work, and you've probably seen a movie recently, right? Um, were actually mathematicians, right? And most of them were actually pure mathematicians. So, you know, people who think, well, they do stuff that will never be applied. No, no, no. <laughs> in this case, uh, and I'll come to that in a second, it was actually a pure mathematics that really held the key to this problem. So what they did was, actually they didn't have computers at the time, so they had to invent them basically, right? So they actually invented the first computers. And what did these computers do? Well, they basically went through all the possible rotor positions. So at Bletchley Park, they had these rooms full of uh, basically replicas of these rotors, and they kind of just click away there for hours, going through all the positions, okay? And then for every rotor position, what they could do is kind of exclude this particular rotor position together with all the possible ways of plugging in things at the bottom, kind of in one go, okay? So that was kind of a parceling up of the problem. So there's these zillions, gazillions of possibilities, so you parcel them up, in a really, really um, smart way, and you take care of these parcels like in one instant, right? In one instant, you just look at it, a current flows, it's possible, a current doesn't flow, it's not possible. And the smart thinking behind it is actually something uh, that anybody who's done a bit of pure mathematics knows, it's called a proof by contradiction. So you use that sort of technique to, for example, show that squared of two is an irrational number. You know, that's, that's pretty far away from any real-world application, but it actually held the key to kind of being able to look at this problem and in one instant go, all the stuff is not possible, okay? So that's, that's what they did. And actually, the same sort of approach worked recently for, for the Rubik's Cube. So again, in the Rubik's Cube, we've got all these possibilities. Now it's a matter of just parceling them up in the right way, having a really ingenious way of dealing with these individual parcels, and then unleashing some computers on them. And actually Google uh, donated like heaps of hours of, of computing time and they, you know, crunched through all the things. And now we know uh, that, well, uh, the worst case scenario is 20. <laughs> and that actually gives you the complete, uh, the complete uh, list of possibilities here. So you can see that, you know, the, it, the numbers kind of ramp up and they kind of peak there somewhere and then a kind of a sudden drop down to 20. So these really worst case positions, there's actually quite a few of them still. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if somebody actually scrambles up a cube for you and, and you ask, well, what, how many moves can I expect here? Right? If, if a superhuman being is unleashed on this, this, this scramble up cube, what can I expect in terms of moves? It's about 18, it's about 18. That's where things kind of bunch up here in the diagram, okay? Okay, so that was kind of a lot of hand waving, right? So I was just, just saying, okay, uh, so smart thinking there in the background, and somehow that takes care of this 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 huge problem. Um, but I actually want to to leave you with something that you can actually use yourself, like one of those really ingenious mathematical insights that you can bring to bear on the original problem. Okay, so the, which will basically enable anybody here to design their own recipe, okay? So they design their own recipe. Now most people, when they, they first um, touch a Rubik's Cube, and let me just get another one here, because I've destroyed one already. So there, <laughs> so that's an intact one. Um, so the first time you scramble it up, and then you try really, really hard for a couple of hours, and then what most people who are really serious about this uh, manage to do is they can fix the first layer. 
Okay? They can fix the first layer. So these nine, nine pieces that you see here, those everybody can, can do. Okay? So this, those everybody can do. All right, now my claim is, if you get to the stage, if you're persistent enough to get to the stage where you can solve the first layer, then you can solve the whole cube. Now, most people actually give up at this stage. Why do you give up? <laughs> because anything you do now, pretty much anything, well, you can do this, right? That won't destroy the first layer, but anything else will cut through the first layer and actually destroy what you've, you've just, uh, you know, put together like in an hour. So basically what we need at this point in time is like sequences of moves that only touch very small parts of the cube, but don't touch anything else, okay? So things that manipulate only very small parts of the cube. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Okay, so here, here's the idea, the basic idea. It's called a commutator in, in mathematics. Comes up quite a bit in abstract algebra. Here's what we do. So if you are a master of the first layer, and you're all masters of the first layer, I can see you're masters of the first layer. What you can do is, you can do anything you want with the first layer. So if you don't worry about the bottom, kind of being scrambled up, you can take these two guys and swap them around. You can take this one out and flip it, and don't have anything else here in, in the top layer change, right? So for example, let's just focus on this one bit here. This guy here, okay? This guy is an edge piece. What we want to do is basically switch it over. Now, you may not realize this, but I assure you, if you're a master of the first layer, you can do this. Okay. So I'm just going to switch this over now. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just go slowly here. And now, in the top layer, you can see the top layer is, is, is perfectly all right. Uh, the bottom, bottom is kind of messed up. That's bad to start with, but, you know, that's fine. <laughs> now, how do we fix up, how do we fix up the cube? How do we fix up the cube? Well, we'll run this whole thing backwards, okay? <laughs> so if I run what I've just done backwards, it's going to restore the cube, okay? Let me show you. So I'll run it backwards. So we go uh, like that. And it's back to normal, okay? It's back to normal, right? So forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. You just practice this for a while, okay? So you design your move of doing this. It will be different from my move. Doesn't matter, right? You run it forward, you run it backward. You run it forward, you run it backward. Until you're really, really okay with that, okay? So let's run it forward now. You, you've practiced this for an hour, right? Now we run it forward. Okay, so you're in. Okay, we're in now. <laughs> now. Now we just have to take note of what happens when I run this backwards, okay? When I run this thing backwards, this guy is flipped and the bottom is restored, right? That's what it does. Okay, now the trick is, before we run it backwards, we give it a bit of a twist, okay? So we give this bit of a twist. All right, now if I run this backwards now, what's going to happen to the bottom? It's going to get restored. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of magic. I have changed something, but still, you know, I don't change anything essential here. So whatever happens when I run things backwards really just refers to the positions here. This guy gets flipped, nothing else on top happens, and the bottom gets restored. So what I do is I just make a twist like this. Now I run it backwards. So let me just run this backwards now. And there. Now I just have to untwist this thing here. And you can see now the magic's happened. The magic's happened just based on my move or your move, right? And what's happened is that everything here stayed unchanged. The only thing that's changed is these two guys have been flipped over, okay? And with a move like that, with a move like that, you can actually uh, fix the orientation of all the, the edge pieces of a cube. And you can do something similar for twisting corners, for example. So as a master of the first layer, right? you design a move that kind of twists one of these guys. Then you kind of do this, untwist, do that. And you've got a move that twists this one and that one. And you can use that to fix up the orientation of all the corners. Okay? And then same as sort of thing for, for actually moving positions. So in total, what you have to do is kind of design a total of four different, different magic moves like this. And you can put them together and, and uh, make your own recipe for the Rubik's Cube. And not only for this one, I've got about 400 of these. <laughs> and this is the, the main insight that gets you basically to all of them. Like I've got uh, things like <coughs> this. 
you know. So a few layers here, <laughs> you know. So I mean, when, once you scramble that one up, you know, it's, you, it's going to take a while to, to fix that. But uh, it's, it's basically the same idea, right? So we've got like a top layer here. We've got a top layer. Once we are the masters of the top layer, we can do certain things. Right? <laughs> okay, anyway, so what that shows you is, or what I wanted to show you is, that although a, cop a problem can be like incredibly complex, right? It's just sometimes these, these tiny ingenious ideas that reduce it to something manageable, right? And that was really the case for, for these, these recipes that we're designing here, and also for, for like really, really big problem. Okay, and you know, that's the Rubik's Cube for you. Thanks.